with Peruvians, if somebody offers you food in their home, it is really, really hard to say no. Because down there, saying no when somebody offers you food is like one of the most e offensive things you can possibly do. If, if somebody, like, and this, it's really sad too, because these families, like a lot of them, they won't have all that much food in the first place. This is a very poor culture as well. You will see, you'll see people well off, you'll see people who are doing well, but you'll also see a lot of poor people, people who are just barely scraping by, who are just barely trying to get through all this stuff. And like, it's, it's just, it's sad. And yet here they are, uh, they will offer you food. It doesn't matter who you are, what you're doing, you know, as if they're decent people, like whether they're interested in the church or not, whatever, they will always offer you food because that's customary. That's what you do. Um, but as missionaries, of course, we're restricted in what we actually can accept to eat down there because the water is, is really not that clean. The water has a lot of issues. If you're going to be drinking the water, it either needs to have been boiled and prepared in the pension or it needs to have been filtered or just bought in bottles. Because if you're just drinking tap water and things just like that, it can be fairly bad for you. And it can, can cause a lot of problems. And if things aren't cooked properly, which a lot of people down there don't realize that because uh, a lot of us are foreigners and a lot of us are from outside the country, even if we're just like from nearby countries, going there, eating the food, which can be prepared a bit badly uh, with microorganisms, with spices, with other things that we're not used to, we can get really sick. Which is why it is a rule in the missions down there that you're not supposed to accept food just from anybody or under a lot of circumstances where they cooked it. But for the most part, they won't know that. And they will offer you food. And it is so, so hard to explain to them that I cannot eat your food. Because they will get offended, they will be sad, and all the, a lot of them will probably just be sitting here thinking, oh, those Mormon missionaries are so rude. They said no to my food. They don't want to eat my food. They must not like me. The uh, jerks. You know, so at culture, that's something that, especially for the missionary work, which you, you will have to note when you go there, is that you have to be careful how you approach that situation because we want to be obedient to the rules, but we don't want to offend them either. And a lot of times you're going to have to make some very hard decisions under that circumstances. There were times when I ate the food, quite frankly, because I really didn't want them to feel bad. And then there were other times where I refused to eat the food, but I tried to explain to them why I couldn't eat the food, but I think they still got offended. And some of them were members who knew better. <laughs> but you will, you will just have to make some decisions in those moments and decide what is going to be better here. And that's kind of a moment when you also have to sit and go, okay, you know, Heavenly Father, do I eat the food? Should I eat the food or should I be more obedient? And you will have to make that decision yourself to the rule. Um, and I, I won't judge anybody also who eats the food either, because quite frankly, I did it, and it's it's hard to say no. Um, let's see, culturally, other things to note with Peruvians. A lot of them are generally fairly happy people. Um, there's a lot of drinking there, just be warned of that. <laughs> um, trying to think there's a lot of fun things that they do too like they've got a they've got a really rich culture as far as dances and customs go uh, and for example in Huancayo it's just the Huancayo which is in the province of Hunin itself you will find tons of different traditional dances that they do one of the one of the more common for example is called Wailash and that is that's it's hard to explain exactly the dance but the, the ladies have these cool extremely like detailed uh, detailed skirts which they've had all just prepared and everything like that the guys will have on the vests and they'll just do this really cool dance which is really uh, it's, it's, it's cool it's hard to explain it other than that um, I would suggest looking it up on the internet if you want to see a little bit more of it but that one's a cool tradition something that I really like but then they've also got all these other other like dances and other celebrations which they'll be doing um, I'll give you a really cool example of one in Wanaco Monaco, just that little city to the north, has this celebration during Christmas. It's based on a Catholic tradition of worshiping the baby Jesus, in which they, they will worship the baby Jesus, so they do it around Christmas. But it's called Los Negritos, the El Baile de los Negritos. It's In English, that would be translated the, the black people dance. <laughs> But what it is, is it's actually harkens back to days when Wanaco, with a lot of the mines that were around it, a lot of the uh, lords and ladies of the land 
lords and ladies of the land, I say. They, they still deal with a bit of that kind of an idea. But a lot of those, those mine owners and the, the owners would bring in slaves, of course, to do a lot of that work for them. So they bring in a lot of people from Africa and from areas like that to start working in these mines. And a lot of times that was very hard for them. I mean, they had the, the, the taskmasters in the mines, some of the, the foremen who would be, of course, like with the whips and making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And according to the tradition, what these slaves then would do, the, the one thing that they could do to help relieve some of that stress of being in that slave or being in that situation was they would dance. And what they would do is they would prepare their costumes and they would do it specifically on the, the celebration of the baby Jesus and they would do a dance. Well, that started converting into an actual tradition, which now is just fully present in Wanako today. And what they do is they prepare these like extremely detailed costumes, honestly, and they make these like masks. But they've got some black ones for the negritos, the the slaves. They've got these white bearded ones for the Spanish foreman of the mines. Um, the white bearded guys. There's like two of them within the dance who basically just go around making mischief with noisemakers and cracking little whips and just being silly generally. Um, and then, of course, during the dance, you have the lord and the lady, who are the owners of the mine, who would also appear during the dance. Um, you just have a bunch of the negritos, and the, the costumes for this are honestly ridiculously elaborate. And they've, like, they've got this um, thing attached to these huge wide-brimmed hats that they're wearing on top of these masks, which just goes up, and it's just covered with these different rows of feathers. Like, I swear they just use feather dusters for it, but they can because that's, that's kind of the look they're going for. And it just kind of goes up like that. And then they'll do this dance every Christmas. The streets just fill up with guys doing this dance. Guys and girls dressed up in these costumes doing this traditional dance. And during Christmas, it's very hard to get around Wanuko just because everywhere. It's everywhere there. And I almost got to see it in person. Almost, if they hadn't transferred me the week before Christmas to the jungle, which for me was kind of sad because I really did want to see it. But I got to see people start doing it like sporadically around Wanaka because they would just do it also as, as the Christmas season got closer. For me, that was kind of like a really cool tradition as far as the dance and the customs go. And it was a Catholic tradition. Um, which is a little bit awkward again because we don't worship the saints or and we don't worship like the different images of Christ that the Catholic Church worships. But as far as respecting their culture and acknowledging that this is something that they've put into their culture and their tradition, especially in that area, it was a really cool experience to see. And you'll see things like that anywhere in Peru. Like in the jungles, they've got some dance traditions, of course, too. Um, in the jungles, you also find the indigenous uh, tribal people's traditions, which is really cool to see as well. And there's a lot of things like that, honestly, just everywhere you go. And it's, it's a really cool tradition to participate in as far as our culture is. We didn't, well, we didn't really participate in it, I should say, but to see, to get to be a part of, to see, watch it. When you get to Peru, you will see a lot of Catholic traditions because Peru has been primarily Catholic as a lot of other South American countries. So you will see a lot of Catholic traditions when you get down there. Like you'll see the, the celebrations for the saints, a lot of things like that. And some of them you might kind of kind of look at, especially as members of the church, we might look at it that kind of cut like a... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but and, and maybe we're not in agreement with what they do, but that's one of the things that when you go there, you have to learn how to respect because it means a lot to a lot of people down there. Um, it even actually means a bit to some of the members who are still new and who are still adjusting to the idea that, well, we don't really worship saints, we, we worship Jesus Christ. And that's one of the things you will have to deal with as you get there, as far as the culture goes and traditions. The music in Peru is really good. You will find a lot of really good kinds of music, and they've got a lot of different Latin uh, genres there that you will also hear. Um, on the radio, of course, they'll, they'll pull music from the States. You'll hear English music. You'll hear Spanish music. You'll hear things like that. But if you go for the traditional musics from Peru itself, um, the, the ones that I enjoyed most, at least, would be like cumbia, which is kind of a nice, kind of fast-paced dance music, which is more honestly of just Latin in general. But they've got their, their kind of cumbia there in uh, Peru. As for something that's very specific to Peru, and I will warn you, you have to be very careful with this music. It's called Wino. And for me, I personally don't like it, <laughs> uh, being completely honest. Um, it, it's kind of, it's a very repetitive music that they, that they do. Um, and they'll do dances to it too. 
Um, I saw it, I heard it many times when we passed by uh, celebrations of people in the streets. Um, but it is, it is extremely repetitive. And they also will sing it in a manner that's kind of pitchy, I will say. They're, they're kind of going up and down and up and down and up and down. And you're kind of sitting there going, okay, okay. Trying to be open-minded, okay. Um, what, what really did me in for this one was one time my companion and I, we were uh, heading to a, a leadership conference with all those own leaders and the sister leaders in the mission. And we got on this bus that went from Cerro de Pasco to Huancayo that took about six hours. And the entire drive, this was all they were playing was just this music, just constantly. And then what made it worse was they had this food called tokush, which is these potatoes that they let rot for six months in water. Then they dry it out and they'll make puddings and things out of it. It's, it's gross. That's one of the foods that's banned, thankfully, from our mission. Um, but they had tons of it just on the bottom side of this bus. So we had that smell wafting up to us, mixed in with this repetitive why no music, which sounded a bit like shouting and a bit of um, yeah, shouting, I'll just say, in the music. And it was just by the end of those six hours, we were both just like this. Please make it stop. <laughs> Please make it stop. <laughs> so for both of us, we don't really have that high of an opinion of wino anymore. Just because we, we had that experience. Um, they do have some wino that's good. I liked, uh, there's a few examples of wino that I would say, this is a really good example of what wino should be and what it would sound like. Um, if they all sang it like this, I would love it. It's, it can be a really good music. But because a lot of them will sing it in these other ways, and it just, it sounds a little bit dissonant and a little bit kind of just like a bit rushed and very repetitive, you might get kind of tired of it like I have. Um, that's the only music I would complain about in Peru though. The rest of the music honestly is really good. I, I especially like listening to the music Andina, which isn't just in Peru, that's in all of the Andes mountains, but they use the pan pipes and they'll use like the natural flutes. And a lot of those things are really cool to listen to and I really enjoyed those.